Hello everybody and welcome to the Eddie Leeway Show <laughs> with your hosts Eddie Sutton and Doc Ock. Hello everybody. Hey guys, everybody doing today? Ah, you good? You good? You good? This is our inaugural show. And Doc and I are meeting for the very first time. I've never met this guy. I've never seen him before, even though we have mutual friends. We're just winging it here today just for your entertaining pleasure. And it's lovely meeting you for the first time. And you, and what uh, do you have there? What are you working on today? Uh, well, I'm three quarters of the way done with this bottle of vodka. Oh. So and I'm don't on worry, coffee. I'll make it through. Uh, this is not my first rodeo. It's so. not his first rodeo, but for me it is mine, but I'm keeping it minimal with a cup of coffee, just keeping it simple, dark and sweet, like I am, you know. And that's kind of uh, the theme of our show, the dark and the sweet. Yes, you the gotta be dark and The coffee and the cream, sweet. the ebony and the ivory, well, maybe not the ebony, more like the mahogany and the ivory. <laughs> We're getting there. Either way, we're still virile enough and we wake up with wood. <laughs> Bottom line. <laughs> well, well, you know, I think it, this is our inaugural show. We're really not going to pigeonhole into one particular topic today. We're just going to go for it. It's the start of a new year, 2017, and uh, shit looks bleak. Read the paper. Shit is bleak out there, you know. Uh, a lot of people are wondering what they're going to be doing and, and how they're going to survive not only the month, but the calendar year. And I think that's a pretty uh, scary uh, observation for a lot of people waking up and went to work today, you know. Yeah, um, being nervous is a New York constant, but I've never really felt it as deeply as I do now. But I'm hopeful. Like a bunch of hamsters in a habit trail trap, you know? Yeah, like uh, hamsters staring Richard Gere in the eyeballs. <laughs> no hate to Richard Gere. I'm sure you're a lovely human being. Yeah, I, I could start with the gerbil jokes, but that was a bad rumor, you know? I, I don't want to go there really right now. Not only that, but I've dated my, and aged myself in one statement. I'm so ashamed. Mom, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got visions now with Richard Gibb p pushing Bill Duke over the balcony and uh, uh, what was that movie? Uh, American Gigolo, that's right. Yeah, well, I'm two steps away from another Rod Stewart joke, so let's just cut it, our losses right there and move it. <laughs> Moving right along, we're a bunch of New York City boys born and raised. We've, we've been part of this city for over 50 years. We've also had some of our formative years outside of this city. Talk about yourself for a second, Doc. Where'd you go to school? Well, I'm born in the South Bronx, raised in, uh, on the lovely island of Manhattan, uh, money-making Manhattan, uh, more properly in the Harlem uh, area, upper Harlem areas. I did spend my uh, formative years in Cali. That's right, the West Coast. And then I came home because this is where I belong. So, um, and I haven't left in 30, 35 years. A lot Yourself? Of, a lot of people that know me, I was born and raised in the story of Queens. Um, spent a lot of my younger adult years, and I could call them my criminal years, on the Lower East Side and up in Harlem. So I do know Harlem pretty well. <laughs> um, it's, it's not the same Harlem that was even 20, 25 years ago with the Lord redevelopment no. that's going on throughout this city and even outside of the island. The whole thing is, is wild the way gentrification has become. And you have to understand, I'm partially deaf, so I tend to flub my words. Um, that happens with my New Yorkese accent. But uh, I do remember how the Lower East Side was gentrified. And it's amazing today how a lot of the scary neighborhoods are some of the more prominent neighborhoods today. For example, Hipsterville, Williamsburg, <laughs> and Red Hook are the two in Brooklyn that I think of. And uh, I think Inwood, which is north of Harlem, is more Harlem-esque today than the original Harlem. Yeah, do you remember back in the days where you could just walk down Avenue A and just at night and just 
feel like anything could happen? Yeah, definitely. Especially living down there. Do you remember walking down 42nd Street and actually having to ask hookers to get out of your way? <laughs> I remember asking the buskers in front of the titty parlors where to find weed in, in the middle of the night. <laughs> You know, I remember coming in from a from a trip and I, I got in at Port Authority and I didn't smoke all day. And I went to this particular spot, you know, where the peep shows are off of 43rd. And I was able to get some pretty good weed. I was amazed because, <laughs> you know, it was like 1992 and shit was already changing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know. Well, I, the one thing I remember about the early 90s is... Every now and then, you'd walk down the block around uh, Times Square, something like that, and you see some. They still had prostitutes back there, and the clientele was changing, and the prostitutes were changing, and the pimps were changing. And all of a sudden, what you thought was necessarily a female prostitute might not be. And then you had these pimps that look like they <laughs> they look like something out of a comic book. And I was like, where did these pimps come from? I remember that shit too, especially when I used to uh, work at the tunnel in, in oh, the late shit. half of the 80s. We used to get out of work at around 4.30 in the morning and there would be like anywhere between 6 to 12 prostitutes right on 28th Street between uh, 11th and 10th. And as we would head to the diner to go eat after work and shit like that, we would stop to smoke a blunt and you would see <laughs> scattered throughout the park all of these women. Either they're ducking and hiding the pimps that are coming down the block trying to capture them and put them into his stable. But at the same time, you'd see like you look across at the handball court and all you see is this big blonde woman with her ass bobbing up and down oh, on a pair boy. of sweatpants. I remember going to I remember coming out of a rehearsal studio somewhere in that general area, like 28, 27th Street mm -hmm. on the on the uh, far west side. And I'm like. What's happening with the quality of the hoes? Cause this, I was, I'm looking at this woman that I'm sorry, the bitch was busted. She was like looking like she was in her early fifties, and got a pimp. Yeah, got a pimp, and the bitch had some tight. Ass, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're unfiltered, and I'm drinking Tito. So what can I tell? Anyway, so she had some tight ass pants, and it looked like somebody was carrying a trash bag full of peanut butter in her back <sighs> pocket. And I'm just like, I'm like, people are buying this? They will settle for anything these days. Choosy Johns choose Jif. <laughs> but no, but no hating on that. But even the pimp that was walking with her, this dude looked like he lost his job. <laughs> and I'm just like, nah, nah, that's, that's, that's not proper pimping right there. That's just, that just looks fucked up. No, I, th that's where I first got to see like, like the real pimp. And, and most of them on the West side, even in the late eighties, looked like they were straight out of a seventies black exploitation film. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like I was waiting for Sidney Poitier and fucking Bill Cosby to come around the corner and start like one of those fucking uptown Saturday night scenes. You know what I mean? Because the, the, the pimps were there, you yeah. know what I mean? We just needed the actors on the set. Well, actually, um, in my neighborhood, it got to the point where I, I could walk down Riverside Drive at some point early in the mornings because I'm a morning person and I used to roll down. And all you'd see coming out of the bushes, <laughs> literally coming out of the bushes, these women, young ladies who were, you know, let's be honest, they were in a fucked up situation and... God knows what the hell they were doing there at 5.36 in the morning or Riverside yeah. Drive. And they come out and like, oh, that's a, that's a cute little dog you have there. And be, because I wasn't really accustomed to that lifestyle, I was wondering what the hell is going on here. And you know what? I look back on it fondly because it's just, I miss, I miss the kind of cross-section of stuff people and situations that you would get in they don't make mornings like they used to anymore yeah yeah I, you know i would come out of the club and you'd see this girl with her ass in this dude's face and he's sitting there masturbating and it was like some of the most scariest sights i've ever seen in my life you know what i mean 
and and oh god the things that people do in perversities is is mind-boggling but you see it right there on the street it's like they just did not have any care in the world who was around them you know what i mean it's almost like pissing in the middle of fucking fifth avenue you know what i mean it's like i don't care I got my nose in this bitch's crack. I'm going to whack this shit off. I'm going to get it off. And, you know, who cares who sees it? Who cares? Now, you know? now, what happened to the New York clubs, guys? Well, that is a good question. I would like to wonder what happened to a lot of the New York clubs, you know, thinking about tunnel days and all of that stuff. Because I worked with Steve Rubell at the Palladium back at the hype of the club scene. And I watched its decline as the AIDS epidemic and, and scare kind of destroyed the whole scene. But I think you would agree on me. The 80s was still a blissful time for clubs. Things started collapsing when Rudy Giuliani came into office. Well, well, of course, they, I, collapsing is probably not the word I would use. Because I, I, I understand what he was trying to do, but I don't agree with the outcome. Because the, the the culture of the city got destroyed, yeah. it got overrun and Disneyfied. His mission was what they call quality of life. He was trying to get all those squeegee guys off the street that would come to your window to wipe it down and try to bum change, or a lot of the people who was selling stuff on the streets, the peddlers with their knockoff wares and stuff like that. But the clubs got caught up with that. Yeah, but I don't you think that to some extent. The decline of the club scene in in New York really coincided with the decline of the music business in a general sense. Yeah, you're right about that. I, I mean, I'm just, you know, before we lost CBGBs, we lost a lot of other clubs that were like part of my punk rock hardcore experience as well as yours. I mean, A7 uh, disappeared very quickly as well as like the Mud Club. But then spots on St. Mark's, like Coney Island, oh. and uh, the St. Mark's Motel, you know, which was a hangout at G.G. Allen's for the longest time. It's like, uh, you know. Well, I, that's nothing to brag about, but... Uh, <laughs> true. <laughs> Very true. A funny side story. G.G. Allen's last show. A friend of mine invited me... Um, um, being La- Las Pena's brother invited me to go see G.G. Allen at the very last show he ever did. And I knew about Gigi Allen for a while now. I was like, uh, <clears throat> you want me to go see? G- no, mm-mm, mm-mm, unless you're going to buy me a raincoat. Um, so anyway, that uh, would have been a great merch thing for him. If he would have <laughs> had like silk screen fucking cheap raincoats to sell to his audience. Yeah, yeah, raincoats and whatever shots you need for, you know, penicillin. Shit like that. So anyway, so I said, no, no, I'm not, you know, and I felt kind of shitty because I actually, I actually kind of wanted to see the show, you know, and then let's fast forward 20 years later, I saw a video of the show. I am so glad I did not go to the, because I'm not paying anybody to throw shit at me, bro. Yeah, yeah. I'm not paying anybody <laughs> Uh, mo- most people know G.G. Allen is trying to be the most outrageous guy. Uh, a lot of people have seen his video uh, that he that was released by his brother before he passed away or after he passed away. And uh, Allen, G.G. Right? loved to take a bunch of laxatives before his shows so he can shit and f- throw it all over the place like a crazy old monkey. But also G.G. was known to have like one of those l- small little cocktail Frank Dicks. You know, yeah, 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 it, it yeah, was yeah. always shriveled yeah, up as he was like butt pimple. naked. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that was a scary sight. So can you imagine this guy covered in his own shit, like running at you, wanting to pick a fight with you or hug you or throw but his excrement at you? You know, Eddie, do you think do you think that was valid entertainment? I, you know, the, the guy wrote OK songs and, you know, he was capable of even playing uh, acoustical renditions. I don't understand why he needed to be that outrageous personally, you know. I, I think that was, yeah, actually, you, you're right. I kind of remember him when he had long hair and he was kind of, it was this, he was more punk metal. Yeah. He was punk metal. And... um I didn't think it was bad at all. Yeah, I think I think with the drug addiction that overwhelmed him and his need to 
to always push the envelope as far as with narcotics and whatever else that um, he didn't realize how much of a parody he was becoming. You know what I mean? Well, I remember that actually my exposure to him, uh, I read some interview, I think it was in Penthouse or Playboy. Mm. And this is the first time I, I really heard him speak or read him uh, talking. And he was going, um, well, I have a plan to commit suicide at this date by shoving a grenade, a grenade up my own ass and yeah, jumping yeah. in the audience. I'm going to do it this Halloween. And yeah, then when Halloween yeah, came, yeah. I'm going to do it next Halloween. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and being a sick fucker I am, I just was like, well, if somebody's willing to do that, I'm willing to watch it. Yeah, and, and a lot of people, I think, were willing to buy that ticket, and I think he caught on to that pretty quick. Yeah, and... You know? But when you're a drug addict and you're looking to make money so you can keep doing your drugs, that's what you're going to do, ah, folks. You know? See, I didn't think about that and, part. And the one cataclysmic show that he did when he had no intentions of dying that night, he died. Ah, see, I was when when my friend invited me to that show, I was just like, well, I don't want to be the motherfucker in that last show. Yeah. I was living <laughs> on the Lower East Side when that shit happened, man. It was crazy. Like after the show, it was off of like being second. It was uh, done up in like uh, the scrap bar style with all that uh, welded art. Rivington School? Oh, Rivington School was it? I always thought it was that gas station that was fenced in over on B and Second. I think you're right. I think it was gas station. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't cut me off, man. I know what I'm talking about. Our producer cannot the, be heard right yeah, now by the audience. We have voices in he's our head talking to us. to us, and and they're supposed to be helping us, but they're not at the moment. <laughs> but let me get my point across. Um, Gigi's last show was off of being sick in a gas station uh, that was done up in all that old welded scrap metal art. And um, it was pretty wild. When he closed the show, he took off and he bolted from the corner mm. and, and station that they turned the club into. And um, he took off and he ran down the streets with a bunch of his fans following him. And yeah. kind of disappeared into I the night. I saw that video where he had some young lady with him. Yeah, there and he like ran off. Is there a riot? And he and he, no. he copped, you know, and and he went off with this girl, and he wound up dead by the morning, you know. And he had no intention of doing it, so Gigi kind of blew the whole gimmick he was working on for like a couple of years already. I'm a, I'm gonna die on stage and everybody's gonna see it. But no, you wound up dying like a rock and roll cliche. Yeah, yeah. In the morning next to some girl, you know, and, and it's sad. Do you, you know? feel like that was a gimmick? Uh I or mean was I don't, he like I, I mean he wanted it to be a gimmick and he was projecting it as his gimmick, but I don't think that night he had any intention of dying. If he was gonna do that, I think the guy would have did it on stage. But then again, like we said, he was hung like a pimple. So I guess he really didn't have the balls to off himself. <laughs> ah, nice turn of a phrase. So, <laughs> well, you know, that's that's our take it, you, you can't what hear the, our producer saying this, but he's got, let's talk about some New York bands that we grew up on or admired. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about some New York bands, okay? We'll be right back. The Eddie Leeway podcast was brought to you by Eddie Leeway Airbnb. It's 1030. Get the fuck out. Eddie Leeway Airbnb. Fuck you guys.